In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this weekend, this great and powerful opportunity to be present, to receive your power in our lives, the power of your Holy Spirit, to discern the purpose that you have for us, that we would be able to discern the one thing that you have for us. This one thing, to be in your presence, to abide in your presence. And we believe, Lord, that as James wrote his letter, as for wisdom, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all men generously and without reproaching, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways, will receive anything from the Lord. But we ask you, Father, with confidence for wisdom, for that gift. We ask for the Holy Spirit to guide us in our discernment, to drive us in our discernment, that we would see your will and have the courage to do it. We ask this through Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so the Holy Spirit is definitely moving. There's a big crowd here. It's a great thing. A lot of people seeking the Lord's will. So my name is Father Betsyager. Just really brief, brief intro. This last time was super, super short. So I'm one of the friars here at Franciscan. I've been here for two years, and it's been, been great. I've served as vocation director for the friars, and then also in campus ministry. So kind of a whole wide range of opportunity of ministry. But before that, I studied in engineering before becoming a friar. Got my degree, turned on two jobs, and uh, joined up with the friars, with the TOR, through the regular Franciscans. So I've been in for nine years, and I've been a priest now for about two and a half. And the Lord has been good. The Lord has been good. So I grew up in Catholic home, central Pennsylvania, uh, about two and a half hours east of here. I have six sisters. Just my grandparents are Catholic, my great grandparents are Catholic, kind of goes back all the way. And we'll get a little bit more into my discernment of okay, how did I get from studying engineering to becoming a friar. That'll come later. It's about discernment and kind of this. So we'll get there. So today though, because I'm the vocation director, maybe you're afraid it's only about discerning the priesthood of the disciple. It's bigger than that. It's much bigger than that. And what we want to get at is there are really kind of two types. And Paul, in the first letter to the Corinthians, speaks about discernment. And he speaks about the unspiritual man does not receive the gifts of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And so we look at this natural discernment as ordinary prudence. It's kind of logic, walking through it, very, perhaps overcautious, perhaps. Uh, but then we have the spiritual discernment, which is driven by the Holy Spirit, sometimes unexpected. At the same time, on the outset, I want to preface and say, okay, we also want to be careful that we remain within the heart of the church. Because it's really, really easy to say, well, I'm led by the Spirit, and to go off the rails. It doesn't make a whole lot. Because it's easy for me to get confused, I'm sure for each of us, to get off track, to be stuck aside, and we'll get into some pitfalls at the end, before the question and answer session. So the first thing, the obvious indicator of what the Lord's will is for us, is holiness. The church lays it out, it's really clear, and that's really kind of the heart of what we're talking about this weekend with this one thing from the Psalms, where it's to be with the Lord. To be with the Lord is to get there, is to be whole. That's how we approach that, this relationship with the Lord. And so we can approach discernment from that angle, where we can say, okay, if this leads me towards holiness, that's a good first step. Very practical, very basic, and it's outside of my own head. I don't have to think about it, figure it out myself. The tradition, the wonderful tradition of the Catholic Church has laid this out for us. And the Holy Spirit is a fire. So we place our trust there. And then the last, the last aspect of it is we're charity. So holiness leads and is integrated and all connected with charity. So if we don't have charity, as Paul says, it's all washed. That's a paraphrase. 
<laughs> but the idea is that if it's something that seems led by the Spirit, but it doesn't lead to charity, well, it's wrong. Inherently. So we could, there's something, so as a Franciscan, St. Francis of Assisi, very near and dear to my heart, it's hard for us to gauge at times, it's like, okay, am I on the right path of holiness? Am I really doing it? Am I, am I off? Am I wrong? Am I failing? Because we can feel really self-conscious sometimes about these things. Like, I don't want to say I'm holy, but like, am I? I don't know. So like, spiritual direction is good for that. Wise counsel is good for that. But there's some baselines. So Francis of Assisi, our patron, he has this letter to the faithful, and that's really the earliest rule of the third order regular Franciscan. So myself and, and Father Jonathan back here in the back, we've seen him around. He speaks of five keys that we can make, measure and gauge where we are on our path with the Lord. And so the one is love of God. Second is love of neighbor. Third is hatred of sin. And then the reception of the sacraments is the fourth. And I'll repeat this because people are taking notes, I can see. And then five is the fruits of penance, which is works of mercy, spiritual corporal works of mercy. So love of God, love of neighbor, hatred of sin, reception of sacraments, especially the Eucharist, and fruits of penance. And so whenever we have those things at the base of our life, we're probably in a pretty good place. Because it's in that, whenever we have this foundation of holiness, it becomes much easier to discern where the Lord is leading. And that leads to the second part, evangelization. So the church exists for the purpose of mission. Because if the Lord has led us to that, to that relationship with him, then he's obviously guiding us to share that with others because that's why he was to share that life with us. And then he commissions. And he says in Matthew chapter 28, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. So discernment, and then we'll get into the practical details here in a moment, it has to do, like we, we understand the first part, holiness. It's laid out, it's in the catechism. We can look it up, we can see it. But the more practical aspects of what that looks like for me, for each one of us, falls under this category. How am I to serve? How am I to give of myself, to give a mission, to evangelize, to reach out? Is he calling you to go and become a missionary? Or is he calling me to be in the home, to be a family? That be part of the family, to work a regular job and support my local parish? Or anywhere in between? Your religious life, single life, married life, ordained ministry, whatever. So that's what we're getting into. So there's the big V, so like I'll use these terms a little bit to help categorize the big V vocation is kind of this more permanent state. Obviously things can change, like if you're married, your spouse can die, things can change. But the big V vocation is this more permanent, stable aspect of our life, more rooted in our identity. And that's first. And then the second is a sort of small V vocation, which is more of small, more directive, more transitory sense of mission. And maybe the Lord is calling you to be a Bible study. That could be a small one, but it's a purpose. It can call other people. We, we heard last night, Peter was talking about leading that group and having the guy come in who didn't speak, who only drank here. Okay. But that was mission. That was a small V vocation. Because that, that time has changed. He's doing different things now. But it's the Lord's will. So this is where we're going. So some general principles. Okay? God first, be second. Every time, all the time, no matter what. So it, when what I mean by that is God's divinely revealed will. What we have received through the Holy Spirit, through the church, that's first. And then if, if I don't like that, that's on me. I have to change. I have to allow the Lord to in to change my heart so that I can then be converted and desire what the Lord desires. 
that's a good general principle. Because if we don't have that straight, well then, what's the point of anything? It's a relationship. And under that is the idea that God loves you. And he has a plan. And he wants you to know it so you can do it. And he can rejoice in that. It's not that we're trying to earn his love, but it's that his love is first. And it's out of that love as we can receive it more, deep, more and more deeply. Then we're able to live it. We're able to follow it. And that fruit comes through. So it's his love first, our response. Just back and forth, always. So Peter last night again spoke of the, his lordship. Worship. That's our response. And from that, he guides us into these more practical things. So what we'll cover is largely found in Father Mike Scanlon's What Does God Want? It's a book he wrote, basic practical tips on discernment. And I'm going to flesh it out in a little different ways. But that's in the book if you want to go through it. So what we'll do at the moment is to pause. Close our hearts. Close our. Sorry. We don't have to close our hearts. <laughs> close our eyes. If you feel comfortable doing so. And open our hearts. And ask the Lord what it is He desires you to bring to discernment. What He desires you to bring to Him and to receive guidance on. So that as we walk through this, you can have something to ponder. So Lord, we offer you this time. And we pray for your wisdom, your insight, that we would see what it is you desire us to bring, to discern with you, to see through. It's our Holy Spirit. So, five keys. If you can't read it because of the distance, I'll read it off. Don't worry. He has these five principles, though. And it's, it's really, really important as we have these five principles. So, one is conformity to God's will. And I'll be repeating these throughout. So, you'll get it again and again and again. So, conformity to God's will, conversion of heart, consistency, how God's worked in the past, confirmation by others and or signs and a conviction of heart. So these five keys. And it's important that we pay attention to the order at which we see these. Now, they're not going to come in chronological order all the time, and we'll get to that. But they, it's important as we keep it ranked in priority because, as I said earlier, it's easy to get off the rails if we focus too much on our own interior experience and we forget say, the teachings of the church. And it's a rough day. But if we keep these things in priority, then we have this fail state, this reassurance that the obedience to the church is going to guide us and protect us and help us to truly find the Lord's will. So to do this, I'm going to use an analogy or a case study. And it's should I have a cheeseburger? Good. It seems kind of dumb. It's a little ridiculous, I know. But the, it makes it kind of vivid and memorable, and it's really easy to make practical. So, as we walk through, we'll touch base on the cheaper. So, the first one is conformity to God's will. So, as I said earlier, this is God's divinely revealed will, public revelation, the big stuff, scripture, tradition, magisterium. That's the gift from the Holy Spirit. We have Acts of the Apostles. The Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. Boom. Peter preaches. Great. And the tradition of the Apostles having walked with Jesus. So we have that and we can rely on that. So this is, it may seem at first a little bit rule-based, but it's actually how the spirit works. But it's not natural or human wisdom merely, but spiritual wisdom. Because then we can walk down, we can trust it. It's no longer, at first it's not a question of, okay, well should I, shouldn't I? We look at something as objectively as we can. So it's a question of good versus bad. Or something that's good, that's not mine to have. So an example would be sex outside of marriage. 
Okay, obviously not a good thing, right? Church teaches that. We believe that. Emotions run high. I hear confessions. It happens. Okay. And if we lose track, and we think about it only from our personal interior experience, we're like, oh, well, like that's great. It feels great. Like, mm-hmm. Okay. So we can, but this conformity to God's will would protect against that type of mistake. So the cheeseburger. Okay. So a cheeseburger is not against the Lord's will, unless, of course, it's actually when it's here <laughs> That's a fail signal. So passes the first test. So scriptural example, we have King Saul. Okay, so conformity to God's will. So he does some really good stuff. He goes to battle against the Philistines. He has David go out against Goliath. Goliath is dead. But he also does a lot of bad stuff. Saul himself. He went against the Lord's divinely revealed will that came through the prophets, and he did not destroy the Amalekites. And then he did pretty well. He got rid of most of the witches, most of the wizards, mediums. But then whenever he made those mistakes, despair, he turned to the wrong source. He went to the witch of Endor. So that's this image, this Saul before the witch of Endor. Samuel comes up and says, okay, well, you really screwed up this time. And he says, the next day, you and your sons are going to be dead in battle. So, conversion with conformity with God's will. So, an example of what not to do. The next steps, so phase two, is conversion of heart. And this is, so as a third order regular Franciscan, this is Again, near and dear to our hearts, this idea might annoy this turning to the Lord, always turning back, growing in holiness day by day, step by step, little by little. And it comes down to, okay, does it pass step one? Yes. If two, is it going to help me grow in holiness? Will it help me fulfill my responsibilities better? My relationship to other people? My relationship to the Lord? And will it be an occasion of sin? If yes, so the cheeseburger, maybe, we could still have a cheeseburger, if I haven't had three already, and then that's left me. So we can move on to that. So an example, a scriptural example, is King David. So King David, like Saul, had some good, had some bad, more good than bad, by and large, because he was beloved of the Lord, and he had this repentance mm-hmm. in his heart. And that's ultimately what carried him through. Despite his mistakes, his repentance brought him back. So he loved the Lord tremendously, and he did all sorts of things for the Lord. And he went and he fought in battles that the Lord directed him to fight, and he was victorious. And he decided to build a temple and for great fruit, even though the Lord said, you can't do it, the Solomon can do it. But he also did some bad. So we know in 2 Samuel 11, the story of Bathsheba. David, as the passage goes, when kings go off to battle, he decided to stay in Jerusalem. But he wasn't fulfilling his duties, and then it became an occasion of sin. Now we know how the rest goes. So this conversion of heart, he wasn't attentive to that. Again, later, 2 Samuel 24, he had the census of Israel taken. And that's this tension back and forth of pride and the ability to conquer, to know how many soldiers were in the army. The Lord had pro- proclaimed, you can't do that. No census, because you have to trust in the Lord. So it's this idea that if the Lord guided him to go to battle, it didn't matter how many soldiers he had. It shouldn't have mattered, but he wanted to know. And then there was a plague, the fall. And then at the end of his life, we have neglect of his family. So 2 Samuel 15, you have Absalom working in the background, his son usurping the kingdom from underneath. So it's this conversion of heart. He was abandoning those duties. He was just kind of living in his own little head, not being attentive. And it caused a whole lot of trouble, and turmoil. And he had his son Absalom tried to kill off, rebel, take over the kingdom, but ended up dying in battle and just tore him apart. But so David, in the end, though, his repentance and his love for the Lord allowed for that conversion 
to take place. Another scriptural example, Jesus. It's always a good go to. And this is where this title, where this talk comes from. So spirit-driven discernment. So Jesus, in Mark 1, after his baptism, at once the spirit drove him out into the desert to be tempted. And so this is, this is a really important point for us, because with discernment, sometimes it's easy to think, oh, it's hard, or it's difficult, or it's a temptation. Now, we, obviously, there's different types of temptation. But if the Lord guides us into a difficult situation, it doesn't mean that it's not the Lord's will. Sometimes he puts us, allows those situations so that we can grow, that so we can be stretched, that we can be strengthened. So Jesus himself, he's facing Satan. And this image is him on the parapet of the temple. And through that, through that temptation, he's accomplishing his mission. So any mission that's worthwhile is going to be tough. Married life, it's tough. There are various points. There's a lot of blessings, but it's hard. Single life, it's hard. Religious life, it's hard. Priesthood, it's hard. The faithful Catholic life is hard. But it's good. So the third one is consistency with how God has led before. So we looked at this to see what are the circumstances of this prompting. Because these, so it's important to recognize these promptings can come in all different formats. They can come in interior dispositions, in prayer. They can come in opportunities outside of us, maybe a job offer, maybe an invitation to ministry. It can come in all forms. And so to look at these is, okay, what are the circumstances? How has it worked before? And how does it fit with how God has worked in my life before? Now, there's a key point. It's like, okay, well, the first time the Lord speaks, it's going to be weird, potentially. Okay, so I'll, I'll use 1 Samuel 3. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am for you to call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. And so Samuel went and lay down in his place. And then the Lord appeared to him again. But so in those situations, if, if the Lord hasn't acted in this way before, to seek counsel, to seek the example of the saints, to seek the scriptures, to seek the teaching of the church, to see if this is reasonable, or if it's big in my imagination. So we have the Catechism laying this out. Number 236, discerning the Lord's presence, kind of paraphrase, is seeing how actions, his actions reveal his inner life. So is this consistent with how the Lord has worked in general? Is this the way that the Lord has spoken to others? Or is this kind of weird? If it is, okay, let's reassess and just take it slow. Do not rush into it. So we have the cheeseburger. Back to the cheeseburger. Have I eaten one on a previous occasion? How did it go? Maybe I'm like this Not a good choice. Maybe I'm going to drink the beef. Okay, but if, if it's not like a no, and it's not necessarily clear, we can probably proceed forward. So a scriptural example I want to use is the Holy Family. So we have Our Lady in the Annunciation, and we have St. Joseph. So Matthew 1 and 2. Nothing like that had ever happened before. Not exactly. Now there have been women who have had children announced by angels. Okay, so that's scriptural. So Our Lady had that to rely on. And then she also had this confirmation from the angel. So there would have been an interior experience where she was unsure, but in the end she did, and she surrendered herself to it, to the work of the Holy Spirit. And so we have our salvation. So it was, sometimes the Lord works in new ways. And likewise, we have St. Joseph. So he has three, four different dreams. Four different dreams. So he has, where he's considering divorcing Mary, the angel speaks and says, take her into your home. And so, 
person named Joseph having dreams is not a new thing in the scriptures. It goes back to the Old Testament. Also Jacob before that. So the Lord speaking through dreams was not unknown. So he could rely on that. And then it was, did it fall over under conformity to God's will? Probably. Because it wasn't against, directly against the Lord's will. And did it bring about conversion of heart? Oh, you bet. It would have been a, potentially a, a great challenge for him. And he did it. So taking Mary to the home, flight into Egypt to return from Egypt, and then moving to Nazareth. So after dream number one, okay, everything goes well. Well, dream two, three, and four, it was perhaps a little bit easier to say, okay, that's the Lord. We're good. Let's go. So number four is confirmation by others and or signs. So at this point, it moves from much of experience external to us to internal experiences. So I'll say for even myself, like this was a lot of confirmation happened internally. It wasn't necessarily an external miraculous sign or anything like that as far as my own discernment, but it was an internal experience and then some conversations with others. But so it's this delicate balance at this point between how much should I rely on others and how much should I rely on myself and the Lord speaking to me. Because it's, it's tense because it's really easy to overemphasize our dependence on other people and to rely on the decisions of others. Ultimately, our life is our responsibility. We can't pass that off. We can't shut it off. We have to take responsibility and act accordingly. But we can look towards these miracles, these signs, these wonders, maybe in ordinary or perhaps extraordinary circumstance, and allow that to be an occasion for the Lord to call this thing to mind, this path, this option, this direction. So from my own discernment experience, it started ordinarily. So I was a uh, senior in college, worked studying as an engineer, things were going really well. I was dating a girl, and she broke up with me, and so I was like, I thought about religious life off and on, but I was convinced, oh no, that's not for me. I'm gonna be married. It's good, I have the next 50 years of my life planned out. Uh, well, looks a little different now. <laughs> but it was gonna look different. And so I, I said to the Lord, finally, I'll look, I'll look at it. But it was the circumstance that was the confirmation to begin. The circumstance was, I got broken up with. I was a mess. And I gave the Lord a shot to show me that path. Now, other people have different experiences. Some have sort of miraculous moments. Uh, asking to rest for a rose is a fairly popular thing. But that's fine. <laughs> I mean, there's all these different things. Praying to the saints for their intercession some sort of indicator, some sort of interior movement of the heart. And the Lord can work through that to get our attention. But going back to the beginning, the key principles is we have to be attentive that this doesn't take priority over the teachings of the church. Otherwise, we end up in heresy. Not a good choice. So we can look to Acts of the Apostles, Acts 1, and the selection of Matthias. So Judas had committed suicide. They needed 12. It was before Pentecost, so they didn't have the gift of the, whole, the gifts of the Holy Spirit in that way. And so Peter says, okay, who are we going to pick? Come up with two. They can't pick between the two. And they don't want to be biased, so they offer it to the Lord by casting lots. Now, I'm not recommending you go get dice and decide to <laughs> your life that way. Not a good choice. Pulling straws. There's a, there's a history to this in the scriptures that the calling of the high priest, as who was going to serve as the high priest, came by the casting lots. So there was a history in the scriptures. So we can look to that. But then it comes to a fuller sense of discernment at a later point. But to know this is that the Lord works through these circumstances, whether it's a confirmation in the positive or a confirmation in the negative that we shouldn't do. So we can look towards opportunities that open up kind of random or that we plan, perhaps. But it's like, oh, well, maybe I'll take this job. 
and then you get the job offer, you're like, okay, well that's a confirmation to at least take the next step. Now, by way of example though, is we can we sometimes the Lord invites us to persistence, to keep trying, to keep asking, to keep seeking. And then there's a point where that is the Lord saying, okay, like pull off, back off. So an example, if you ask someone to go on a date, and they refuse to gather a couple of times, if you persist, that's called stalking. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably not called to get married. Not to that person. So that's just by way of recognizing in a practical sense that the Holy Spirit can prompt us. So it's, it's keeping all these things in context. So comfort, conformity to God's will, conversion of heart, consistency, fourth confirmation. So the cheeseburger, back to the cheeseburger. Okay, so if there are no cheeseburgers available, I don't know what they have in the tent, um, it's probably a confirmation you're not called to eat a cheeseburger. <laughs> okay, context. But if someone invites you to go to Five Guys, we can get a cheeseburger. Okay, so the opportunity is there to take the next step in discernment. Now, should you discern about eating a cheeseburger or not? It's like, no, that's not the point. The point is to make it memorable and kind of graphic. In the hell, in the good sense. So, a scriptural <laughs> example of, of this, of confirmation, is Moses and the Israelites in the desert. So, in Numbers chapter 9, the Israelites have just left Egypt. They've just built the tabernacle, all the various portions of things for the sacrifices. And the Lord comes down in the cloud by day, fire by night. Chapter 9, verse 15 to 23. On that day, the tabernacle was set up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, and the tent of the testimony. And that evening it was over, so that the tabernacle made the appearance of, it was over the tabernacle until the appearance, like the appearance of fire until morning. So it was continually, the cloud covered it by day, and the appearance of fire by night. And whenever, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tent, after that, the people of Israel set out. And in the place where the cloud settled down, there the people of Israel encamped. At the command of the Lord, the people of Israel set out, and at the command of the Lord they encamped. As long as the cloud rested over the tabernacle, they remained in the camp. Even when the cloud continued over the tabernacle many days, the people of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and did not set out. So the point that we can take from this is when we have clear direction to move. And when it's not so clear, the whole course. Another example, Judges chapter 6 through 8 is Gideon. So Gideon is called by the Lord to fight against the Midianites. And the Lord calls him, Gideon's a little, uh, little apprehensive. He hasn't been in battles, he hasn't been a leader, and yet the Lord has called him. So he wants to be sure, because well, they've been under persecution from the Midianites for quite some time. And Gideon said to God, If thou wilt deliver Israel by my hand, as thou hast said, behold, I'm laying a fleece of wool on a threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece alone, and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that thou wilt deliver Israel by my hand, as thou hast said. And it was so. When he rose the next morning and squeezed the fleece, he wrung enough dew from the fleece to fill the bowl with water. Then Gideon said to God, Let not thy anger burn against me. Let me speak but this once. Pray, let me make this trial only this once with the fleece. Let it be dry only on the fleece and on all the ground that it do. And God did so that night. For it was dry on the fleece only and on the ground that it was due. Now, if you go out and buy fleece and start to do this, it's debatable as to whether or not the Lord would actually act in this way. But the idea is that we can ask the Lord for guidance, especially if we're asked to do a big thing. Leading the nation in battle against their persecutors, that's a big thing. So we can seek that guidance from the Lord so we know it's not just us. So the fifth is conviction of heart. Do I believe it's morally right? Do I believe it fits the other criteria and I want to do it? So those pertain to conscience. This moral conviction of this, 
of an action of being good. Being inspired by the Spirit and knowing this is the Lord's plan. And it's good. And we can see this as our conscience, so we can look at it. So if you want to reference that Catechism 778, well, we can look towards these first three steps. So conformity to God's will, conversion of heart, and consistency. Those are what form and guide our conscience over time. Being rooted in those things, we can place our trust in that the Lord is, we're allowing the Lord to form us, to guide us. So then we have to face the question of, okay, am I, am I afraid? Because if we're ready to go at five, we've done one, two, three, four, and five, it's like, yes, do it. Go for it. Eat that cheeseburger. Okay? But if, it, if there's a hesitation, if there's a fearfulness, then we have to ask further questions. We have to consider, okay, why am I afraid? Is it simply God is prompting me to do something difficult? Or rather, is it something that the Lord is saying, this isn't, this isn't what I want you to do? And the way we can get into that is if it's attached to any old experiences, any old wounds, any old injuries, any ways that we failed or had something that's not true spoken in our life. And then we can seek the Lord, seek healing on that. And then uncertainty is the other part. So how strong is it? Is it just like, well, I don't really know. The Lord, Holy Spirit is prompting me to do something new and difficult. Okay. Maybe pray for courage. But if it's not that, it's a, if it's more serious, then we can go back and go back through the questions again, reconsider it, come at it from it. So the cheeseburger, it's like, if it'll scandalize somebody, I probably shouldn't do it. But, or if I uh, have had multi bypass on my heart, probably not a good choice. But if it's reasonable, I'm pretty healthy, like, probably enjoy it. It's like, not a big deal. Kind of go ahead. So if it's unimportant, like if, so if we're trying to discern something that doesn't have strong importance in our life, then some of these are a little bit more wishy-washy. It's not really stuff that we have to take in this level of intensity. Okay. But for bigger things, buying or selling a home, moving somewhere else, taking on a ministry, uh, how to work like, to take care of your family, your kids, your parents, whatever it is, and these are things that we have to consider. So we look towards, so I, I look towards my own story, my own vocation, and I call towards priesthood and religious life. And it took time. But at the beginning, the so Lord caught my attention with a confirmation. So it's circumstances and then a confirmation follow. So I went and visited a couple communities and it didn't really, wasn't really a good fit. And I had come to know the friars for a while. And I had to get on my come and see it. And I was like, okay, this is maybe where I'm called. And then I went. And it was just this profound sense of belonging, peacefulness. And this is where I want to be. I don't believe. This is a great weekend. And yet I was a month out from graduation, so my parents were a little anxious. <laughs> okay. I had a job, two job offers, a down payment on an apartment. Graduating in a month, graduating towards the top of my class, and uh, I was like, okay, I want to apply. They're like, don't you want to wait here? Maybe work, the fires will still be there. So, and as an engineering background, I'm usually pretty pretty logical, pretty systematic, and so it seemed outside of my character. So that's where, yeah, we'll go to this unusual guidance from the Holy Spirit. Seemed out of place. My parents were concerned. That's a their point. It's like, okay, rightfully so. They had no idea of my interior experience. And yet, the Lord had so profoundly moved in a clear way that fit with his will, that was calling me to conversion, that was consistent. And I had conviction of heart. I had no qualms about walking away from the job, losing the down payment. Just no qualms. Praise God. Otherwise, I'm going to do But I'm here. Praise the Lord. 
So we have another example, scriptural example, of this conviction of heart, knowing that it's God's will, and persevering in it, even though it's difficult. So it's St. Paul, in Acts 16, and Acts 19. And he was prevented. So he was prevented from going into Bithynia to preach by the Spirit of Jesus. We don't know what that means exactly, but he was prevented. So it's the guidance of the Holy Spirit. But then, he was over various times, he was told to go to Jerusalem. And at the same time, he was told when he went to Jerusalem, he was going to be bound, he was going to be imprisoned, face hardship, and be killed. And other people knew it because they would hear the prophecy being spoken in these various towns, and they say, Paul, don't go, don't go, you're going to die. But then he says, Acts 21, for I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be persuaded, he ceased and said, The will of the Lord be done. And so this is this conviction of heart is what carries us through the hardship. So we can seek that from the Lord, especially whenever we know it's a difficult mission. Okay, so that's the last of the key points of Father Mike Scanlon's five C's of the sermon. But so we have these weird, weird promptings from the Holy Spirit sometimes. Because most of the time it's pretty normal. Sometimes it's not. And so we look at Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. So Philip, this is, this is a crazy story. It doesn't even make sense in my head how it works. But he's going along, and the Spirit says, okay, rise. An angel says, rise, go to the south. He goes along, he comes across this Ethiopian eunuch who had been to the temple of worship. So he's like, it's like walking up to the vice president and asking to get into his limo. <coughs> okay, that's what we're talking about here. Philip does, and he begins talking and asking, okay, do you know what you're reading? And eventually he ends up being baptized. And then Philip disappears. Physically, just like, poof, like I just disappeared and showed up in Pittsburgh. Like, that's what we're talking about. Holy Spirit does weird stuff. Okay? I haven't seen that myself, thankfully, but it's hard to say what the Lord's going to do. But we can look to that and say, okay, let's not put the Holy Spirit in a box. It might be something abnormal from our own experience, but it doesn't mean it's not the Lord's will. Likewise, Peter, in Acts 10 to 11, he has. So Cornelius has an angel show up in his house. He's a Roman centurion. Mm -hmm. The angel shows up. Peter has this dream. He's miles away. And the, angel, the Holy Spirit says, there's three guys. They're waiting downstairs. They've come to get you and take you to a Roman's house because the Lord is working in their life. Peter's obviously a little hesitant. He doesn't think it's within the Lord's will because of the kosher laws. He couldn't enter into the home of a Gentile. So he's resistant. He says, by the Lord, like, so he has like the, the sheep being let down with all the animals on it. That's that representation. And the Holy Spirit says, Go. Go. And so he goes. But then he's even still hesitant, but he begins to preach, and the Holy Spirit falls. So the confirmation follows. Because that sometimes we don't have that until after we've acted. But we can always gauge that. So, key highlights. So, we want to rely on stable principles of discernment first, and the exceptions second. If we make our life based off of exceptions entirely, we end up in prison. But if we make decisions based off of stable principles first, and then exceptions, charity always is first. And obedience to the church that will protect us, will guide us. So that scripture, tradition, the magisterium, to know what's true outside of our own personal subjective inclinations. The prayer, keep praying, keep praying, keep praying, pray again, because it's that relationship where we find the Lord. It's the relationship as we grow up holiness that we have that clarity. Another something that oftentimes gets missed is fasting. 
Your fasting is a, an incredibly deep gift that we don't like because it's uncomfortable. Okay. It's hard. It's hard to do. But fasting, so it, it's kind of like weightlifting for the soul. Okay, so you, we take, so as like you go into a gym, there's one downstairs, you can, can't get in there right now. But the idea is you lift weights, you lift what you can, that's difficult, so that you get stronger. So that whenever you go to move your couch, you don't hurt yourself. So the idea here is with fasting, we take on this activity that we know is not going to kill us. And it shouldn't hurt us either. But it's going to stretch us. It's going to be uncomfortable. And through that, then when the difficulty comes, or in this case with discernment, whenever we may have personal information one way or the other, we're more able to set that aside to truly seek what God's will is and follow it. And then again, the same thing is responsibility. Each of us is responsible for our own life, for our own decisions, our own choices, our own actions. We're in a relationship, so that plays a role. But we are the ones who are called to follow the Lord and help others find it. So we can look for the fruits of the Spirit. We can look, as James says in chapter 3, verse 17, but the wisdom from above is first pure, and peaceable, gentle, Open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, without uncertainty or insincerity. So we have pitfalls. Things that we want to avoid, steer clear. So lack of prudence. So this is assuming the most difficult thing is God's will because it's the most difficult. That's masochistic, not a good choice. Another one is proof text. Okay, so that's when we take scripture out of its context for our own purposes. Okay, prosperity, gospel, he example. So the gospel from today, that's straight to the Jesus never said that that woman was going to be a millionaire. Didn't say it. But he did say that she gave more. So the Lord is going to look on that and bless her, but it's not necessarily in this life. He himself was poor. He himself wandered about his immediate followers. We're all poor. Like there's a trend here. Okay, so when we can look within the context of the scriptures to see it in the tradition, and see how we should understand the scriptures. Now, what proof texting is not, so we can look towards Francis of Assisi. So this example where he is trying to discern his life. How is the Lord calling? And he opens the Bible, the gospel, three times randomly. And the first thing he happens upon that he prayed for wisdom, he prayed for guidance, and then he does this. And there was consistency. It was three of the same basic ideas. This life, poverty, this apostolic mission, this evangelical mission. So I'm not saying we should do that all the time, but in those key moments, that's a way we can pray. To call upon the Lord, to call upon the Holy Spirit to guide us and show us. So another direction, pitfall, is be crippled by fear. And that can be caused by relying too much on our own natural discernment. Not letting the Holy Spirit drive us. Because if Jesus went by natural discernment, he might not have gone to the desert. It wasn't going to be a fun time. He might not have gone to the cross. In the sense of natural discernment is folly. Paul speaks about that in the case amongst the Greeks. The cross is folly. But for us, we know that it's salvation. So we can't avoid difficult things because they're difficult. But we can place our hope in the Lord that if he calls us to difficult things, he'll give us the power and the strength to do it. And then the other part of fear is to relying too heavily on others to direct and decide for us. We can ask for wisdom, we can ask for counsel, and we should. But in the end, we have to do it. And then the last two things are psychological conditions and then diabolical influence. So, for body and soul, Catholic Church teaches that that involves the brain, and sometimes things get a little bit off. Okay? Maybe just depression, maybe more serious. And it's hard for us in those situations to make objective decisions at times. 
But so we could, if you know that's something that we struggle with, to know that the Lord loves us, and that he still wants to speak to us, he still wants to guide us, he still wants to give us that plan before us, that we can serve him, glorify him, love him. But we just have to be a bit more cautious. And the diabolical influence, okay, so Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and no wonder for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is not strange if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. So we have deception. So that's where obedience to the church and wise counsel will protect us. Now, not to freak out, like if we're praying for protection, receiving the sacraments, seeking to live a faithful Catholic life, the Lord will preserve us. Let's know that there can be confusion. So if we receive something materially from someone else, and it's against the teaching of the church, we'll go, walk away, let it go. Do not be deceived, but rather to hope in the Lord. In summary, God wants us to know his will for us. He has revealed it, will continue, and our response to his love first, our response and that grace is how it works. Be obedient, be obedient, be obedient. <laughs> it's the only way. And then charity is the test. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. So now, if we have any questions.
perspective, not necessarily seeking to follow their opinion. But um, so, like, by way of a case study, married Catholic man feels called towards priesthood. Well, if you're married, you're not going to become a priest. So, uh, unless you were Anglican before, or Eastern, right? So the idea is, well, the Lord's probably not calling quite to that, but to assume that maybe my perspective is a little bit off. Maybe I'm called to be a deacon. Or maybe I'm called to embrace the priestly nature of the husband or the father in the home. Something like that. Where it's, it's partially there, but it's not completely there. Does that make sense? Okay, awesome. Other questions? Thank you, first of all, very thoughtful talk. And I appreciate the Chief Burger now. <laughs> uh, you had named mention of opportunity. So if there's no cheeseburger at the tent, then how do you get no cheeseburger? Sometimes the question that follows up is what if there's no cheeseburger at the tent, you still feel called to have a cheeseburger? So now it becomes a question. Of the so obviously, there's a deeper meaning to the analogy there, but I appreciate your thoughts on that. Definitely. So the. Uh, that opportunity. So the other question that follows is, am I called to create that opportunity? Right. Perhaps or to look, maybe look elsewhere. Right. Um, but yeah, so it's whether whether an opportunity is readily present or maybe a, a call of persevering for a time and then reassessing the situation. Does that help clarify that a little bit? Yeah. It's a, kind of a difficult thing outside of the outside of concrete. Situations. Other questions? Yeah, so um, uh, I got a question. So you, you're discerning and you're, you know, you're praying about it and, you know, you're still unsure about doing it. But then you just say, you know, if you throw all caution in the wind and say, Jesus, I trust in you and you do it anyway. Is that proper discernment? <laughs> <laughs> so there's an uncertainty and confusion and then have this sense of calling. Is that trust me and do it anyway. Is it proper? Um, so in some situations. <laughs> so like my own by way of example, like my own situation, it didn't make sense necessarily unless the Lord overrides it through the experience. And that's like if there are other confirming factors. So like if there's been good fruit. So that's sometimes there are things that you can't really tell until you take a step. So I wouldn't recommend you married until you know. <laughs> These permanent things are a bit more significant. But if it's if it's less permanent, if it's maybe a new opportunity, a new experience, something that you can try and then see. I was like, okay, maybe the maybe someone has invited you to be involved in a new ministry and you're just you have no experience. In it. And it's unsettling and maybe it's uncomfortable because it Involves you speaking in front of other people or something like that. You're like, okay, Jesus, I trust you. Like, I'm gonna try. It's like, there might be a good way to go. Does that help clarify that? Sure. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, we can talk for a little bit. Okay, we've got have time for one more. Hi. Um. So I have a question. See what, and, and to look back. So this is the other part: is um, each of us baptized, each of us has an individual call. And so to look at our life and see where has the Lord borne the most fruit? Where is the most fruit been in my life? These experiences, these opportunities where I've been able to give of myself generously to serve the Lord, and that has been good. And then to say, okay, what? How can I move? 
in a way, live in a way that maybe follows that track. So maybe I've enjoyed talking to friends. Like I've had a couple experiences talking to friends and been able to support them in difficult times. And then maybe your skill set is like nursing. Like, oh, but I don't really feel called to nursing anymore. Maybe hospital chapels. There's these kind of creative ways that the Holy Spirit can prompt you. So to ask the Lord for those moments, those opportunities, but to not be afraid to look yourself, to ask people what they see is another thing. Okay, we're going to have to wrap up. So just a real quick, quick, quick prayer. And then we'll go. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We want to give you thanks, all glory and praise for guiding us today. We ask for your presence to continue with us on this weekend, that we may see your will and do it. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit.